Painting in progress. Welcome everyone. So today we are talking about painting. Um, in this PowerPoint, we're going to talk. We're going to take a look at various types of media when it comes to painting, elements of painting, uh, a few of the major movements, not all of them by any stretch, but a couple of the big ones are the ones I find interesting at any rate. Um, and then we're going to do some analysis, and we're going to wrap up with the discussion of painting versus illustration, and whether or not they did belong in the same category. All right, so let's get started. Um, There we go. So uh, there are various types of media in painting. There are dry media, things like pencil, charcoal, chalk. Uh, bear in mind, by painting, I'm basically meaning all of visual art. Um, but you can have those types of things versus oil, watercolor, acrylic, tempura. That's where it's mixed with eggs. Uh, these are all wet techniques. So um, take a look at this video of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 3D chalk art. It's very, very, just very pretty. I mean, it's amazing stuff. Uh, watch that on your own. And that's going to be kind of the format for a lot of these PowerPoints going forward. They all have videos attached to them. They all, some of them have other things. I will let you get into that on your own. So this video will be shorter, but do go through it. Do watch these videos. Uh, watch this one about watercolor techniques, uh, at least to get an idea of how some wet work is done. Um, then you have things like printing. Uh, does printing qualify as art? You know, take a look at Andy Warhol. Uh, he made this run, this is pop art. And he made this run of uh, Campbell's soup cans. And all he, these are literally the Campbell's soup cans. He didn't even paint them. He made a silk screen printing of them and just reproduced them. So is that really art? Well, by the same token, nobody's been able to reproduce his silk screens. Like he did a masterpiece job of them. He did a different one for every single can and they are, and he handmade them all identically. So, you know, there's a lot of skill involved and he did one for literally every flavor of soup they had. And the whole thing was criticizing mass produced, you know, commercial commercialism. So does that make it art? Maybe uh, that's kind of up to you. On the other hand, we have one of the 36 views of Mount Fuji. This is an example of ukiyo-e. Uh, it was an artwork that was part of woodblock prints that were mass produced, one of the earliest examples of popular art, mass produced for pretty much everybody. Um, and it was done in Japan in the Edo period. Um, that would be the 16 to 1800s, um, Edo is Tokyo. But it was you know, art for the common person. A lot of it was about martial arts heroes and a lot of it was pornographic. But is that art? Um, I mean, I think it would be safe to say that something this gorgeous, even though it was meant to be mass produced, is still art. Um, but where do we draw the line? I don't know. That's something worth considering. You know, that's that's what I that's one of the nice things about art. It prompts questions about what we value. All right. Um, sorry. Here are some elements of painting. This YouTube video has a walkthrough. Yes, go on. Yeesh. The seven elements of art, I will let you watch it on your own, but they are line, shape or form, color, texture, form or mass. You know, you could use form in either of these, uh, value and space. So line, uh, how are, you know, you know what a line is. What lines do you see drawn in the painting, uh, either there or implied, which we'll look at in a second. Um, what is the shape of things? Are, are they humanoid shaped? Are they geometric shaped? Are they like in our last example, you know, there's obviously lots of triangles here. So that would be part of the shape. Uh, color, you know what color is. Texture. You know, is it rough? Is it? That's one thing that you won't notice as much on these digital images of paintings. 
Uh, but if you look at some of them have implied texture, but if you look at say uh, Starry Night by Vincent Van Gogh, it stands out in like huge crests or huge troughs, the divots, whatever, uh, in these big globs from the palette. So it's worth it to try and see this stuff in person because paint has a physical dimension. It's not just two dimensional, it is three dimensional. Um, yeah. And that also goes with mass. Uh, then you have value, lightness or darkness. Uh, the fancy term is chiaroscuro, which is how light and darkness show up in a painting. And then space, which is either filled or positive space, which is filled or negative space, which is empty. Um, the term is ma in Japanese paintings, such as this, uh, the pine tree screen by Hasegawa Tohaku. And you see here a lot of emptiness, but it creates this image, especially with the implied line, there's that word, of the trees going up. It makes it look like a misty mountain, uh, possibly in the early morning. It's the, the emptiness has a beauty that accentuates the stuff that's there. Also, it's, it's ink on, uh, I think, bamboo screen. And so it's got this kind of streaked effect to it. Um, these are all things you could talk about when analyzing a painting. And I should point out, don't ever say, it uses color. No shit. Um, it uses line. Yeah, it does. Talk about what kind of lines. It uses contrasting colors, like the black and the white. Well, white-ish. Um, you know, it uses vibrant colors or dark colors. Anything like that would work. It uses implied lines. It uses vanishing lines. You know, give, give me something a little to work with more than just it uses line. That's one of the basic elements of visual art. Pretty much everything uses it. Here's another example. Um, the Last Supper. And again, you can see the implied lines. In this case, where are the lines leading? To the central figure of, in case you didn't know, Jesus. He's pretty, he's a pretty big deal. Um, also far too long of hair and white of skin for an accurate depiction, but whatever. Um, the colors are fairly vibrant. Uh, they've restored, you know, they've restored the painting recently and it's a lot brighter than most people were used to. Um, da Vinci painted in bright colors often because, well, why wouldn't you? They're pretty. Um, so, you know, it suggests, I don't know, maybe some festivity, uh, Easter colors that kind of pastels. I, I don't really know if I'm making that up here. Um, the elements of blue and purity, uh, kind of heavenliness. I think that's Judas. Um, you could look up who all of these figures are because they are all identified, or maybe that's Judas. Um, but yeah. Uh, so you have a line, you have the lines going into the vanishing ground to create this 3D effect. Um, yeah. Those are some things you could look at. What other elements are in there? Uh, form, the lightness and darkness, the background is dark and the lightness kind of centers on Jesus. Notice how the table gets brighter as you go towards the center. So it draws your eye to that central focus, things like that. Those are things you could look for when you look at a painting. All right. Um, here are some various older movements in paintings. I call them movements. Uh, really it's just ancient art, but it's cool. Uh, I, as you know, have a background in Chinese, so I think Chinese art is neat. Sure, we um, have a... I will let you watch these videos on your own, but one of them that I wanted to point out is this medieval art and butt tubas. Um, yeah. What is a butt tuba and why is it in medieval, medieval art? You'll have to watch to find out, but... Suffice to say that the ancients were just as silly and as gross and as 
amused by butts and uh, genitalia as we are today. So in fact, a lot of this stuff is filthy. And then you have Islamic geometric design, which is just, it's gorgeous beyond words. Um, and it's highly mathematical. Uh, it's, I mean, look at that. It just makes you want to weep. Um, yeah, I, I really don't know what to say to that. Just watch this to make yourself a better person. All right. Impressionism. Impressionism was a big movement in the 1800s, um, creating the kind of emotional impression of an event. Uh, it's big on blurred lines, not a lot of distinctness or clarity, even in The Luncheon at the Boating Party by Renoir. Uh, it's, and it's got a lot of his friends in it, uh, a lot of people from Paris that he hung out with, some, you know, uh, friendly ladies, let's say. Uh, I don't think that they were necessarily prostitutes, but often prostitutes featured in pictures like this because that's who artists at these times hung out with. I don't know why. I don't, I don't know, just for some reason, I guess it was looked down on to be an artist. I don't know. Uh, they were they were the 1800s equivalent of punk, whatever, however you want to put it that way. Um, but yeah, take, an, take a look at Impressionism. It is a major movement. It, there, it has created some of the best-known art in the modern age. Likewise, abstraction. Um, I find abstraction interesting, not so much because I like it, but because it's intellectually appealing. Like this is Marcel Duchamp's Nude Descending a Staircase. And to look at it, it looks like gibberish. But when you look a little closer, you can kind of see the hip and that looks like a leg or a leg here. These slats, those are the stairs. And this is a, you know, right here is kind of a head and breasts, or, you know, a breast, if you were looking at like a mannequin. And you can kind of see the figure. And maybe I'm just used to it from comics, but like if you ever see the flash running where it shows him at every step kind of merging into the next one to simulate movement. I think that that's what's happening here. Um, the comics probably drew at least in part from Duchamp because he was well known. Uh, so it's it's an, a figure in motion trying to capture motion in and of itself. On the other hand, you get Picasso doing the bulls, and he started with a bull and drew a very lifelike one. Uh, you'll have you can blow this image up in the PowerPoint and see, or just Google it. And then step by step, he starts abstracting. He starts taking pieces away and saying, how much can I remove and have it still be a bull? And what makes a bull a bull? Well, you got its horns, you got the hump, four legs, head, bullness, and a tail, right? And so at each stage, he removes more and more, but keeps those essential bull things until he gets this, maleness, Horns, head, hump, legs, tail. It's clearly a bull. So what's the difference? And it's it's using art to ask questions. It's using art to, to ponder things. Um, and being a highfalutin intellectual type and a big old nerd, I like that. I find that interesting. Um, surrealism and Dada. They're just fun. Uh, surrealism is kind of nutty. Dada, on the other hand, is insulting. Uh, this one was called The Fountain, again by Marcel Duchamp. He was an abstractionist and a Dadaist. Uh, and basically, he it is, and you know, take a look at it. It's a urinal. It's a men's urinal on its side. And he plopped it down on a mount in a museum and said, it's a fountain. Pay me. Um, yeah, it's a gigantic fuck you to everybody viewing it basically tell you him telling them to take a big old drink from this uh, an another similar one was a coke bottle dryer which was just a coke bottle dryer uh the dadaists were nuts um if you want a an interesting modern example take a look at doom patrol season three the sisterhood of dada shows up and they're bizarro um they're also more maybe more surrealist than dadaist at times it's also an adult show. Um, 
yeah, it's it's adult. So, you know, don't look it up if you're not into that. But uh, yeah, it's it's I, it's an interesting show. I like it. It was based on it. It's based on a DC comic series, um, written by Grant Morrison, who is just weird, and in a wonderful way. So yeah, maybe check that out if you're into that sort of thing. Um, I found this interesting. This is just movies and it's TV taking inspiration from the arts. So maybe worth a look like Django Unchained was drawing from the blue boy, things like that. Um, now when it comes to analysis, you can try to figure out what the artist is trying to say. They can be trying to create an emotion or a feeling, um, Perhaps in this case, you know, this is on the Sistine Chapel. This is on the ceiling. You have to crane your neck back to look at it. So it could be a sense of awe or inspiration at God's majesty. That could be the feeling that the artist is trying to create. In which case, where do you see that? How does the color, like the vivid reds or the, the kind of almost pinkish white, that pure... Um, you know, we associate with pink with loving, but that pure white on God or the vivid green, these colors that show God as bright and powerful and vivid create that sense of majesty. See, there you go. You're looking at things like color. You're looking at this majesty descending onto humanity, into the first man. Um, again, creating awe at, our, at how great humanity is, which... Again, you're looking at line in that case to further your argument. So what is what what emotion is the Arthur artist trying to create? Or what idea are they trying to promote? What, you know, for lack of a better term, what are they trying to sell you? Um, in this case, if you see once you see it, you can't unsee it. But this shape here is a cross section of the human brain. an image yeah see it is the human brain overlaid onto god now um as as i will say in another video somebody from a modern perspective might say oh they're arguing that god is made up in our minds eh, probably not this was the middle ages Every, most everybody was fairly uh religious to one degree or another and he was getting paid by the church um now he might have done that but it's probably more along the line i think it's safer to say that it would be something like the mind is a creation of god or the mind is how we experience god or something like that or the mind is what really separates us from the animals and is what created adam that would even might even be a bit humanistic um but any of those could be the argument that you make. And how is that then endorsed? Well, you have God, you know, in the mind. Uh, you know what I mean. I think you get the rough idea. Um, you can look at, you know, the, the starkness of these individuals versus the dull background to the idea of humans and God are more powerful, more important than just in all nature um that humanity is on par with the angels and with god in their definition in their personhood for lack of something better um anything like that you could look at this for deeper meaning what is the artist trying to sell you what emotion are they trying to create or what feeling um you know what is their deeper message and come away with something you can do a similar thing here with Pablo Picasso's Guernica. This isn't a great image. Uh, it's not high resolution. Sorry about that. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this one because you're some of for the humanities 1301 class, you're going to analyze this as part of your common assessment. But you know what what feeling, what feelings does this espouse? Does this arise in you or call arouse? That's the word. I can talk. What feelings does this, does this arouse in you? What does it make you think of? Um, what is it? What's the first reaction that you have? And then how might it be using things like line, like geometric shape, like 
the emotion on the faces or the various jumbled masses, how might those be used to create that emotion or that feeling? And this is in specific relation to, and you'll look this up on your own, um, the bombing of the city of Guernica uh, by the Nazis in World War, before the start of World War II. Uh, Spain was in a civil war. Uh, the, the Republic, I think, versus the fascists. The fascists were backed by Nazi Germany, but this was before Nazi Germany started really taking over stuff. And as part of training Germany's Air Force, uh, they were invited or, you know, kind of arranged for the Air Force to do a bombing run as, you know, training for them on the enemies of the fascists. And they chose the Basque, I think Basque, town of Guernica, which had been completely like out of the fight, hadn't done anything to anybody. They were just there and they got obliterated. About a third of the populace died. The town was leveled and Picasso created a painting in reaction to that. So with that in mind, it might be clear what emotions he's trying to create. Um, also, one point of interest, one word in Spanish for light bulb is bomba, which is also bomb. So yeah, I'll let you take a look at that one on your own and try analyzing it. Take a minute or two and give that a shot. All right, let's continue. Go ahead and pause the video to do that. Uh, then you have Las Meninas by Diego Velasquez. And I'll let you watch this video about why it might be the greatest painting ever um, to get some idea of how to analyze this one. But it's another one that's worth looking at. All right. Uh, and then you have The Scream by Edward Munch. It, excuse me. Um, and I think it's pretty clear here the emotion he's going for is like horror. This figure screaming in the foreground. Uh, it's, it's bald. It looks alien. It feels weird. Everything's in bendy shapes. The sky is the wrong color because in part this was painted after the explosion of Krakatoa and the entire world was more or less shrouded in volcanic ash for a little while, uh, which created orange skies. So it's it's weird. It's alien. It's off-putting. It's frightening. This figure is like in despair over here, leaning against the bridge. It's upsetting. And all of that adds to this, creates this feeling of fear. So again, painting analysis is not necessarily too difficult. And then you would, you know, if you were established, if elaborating on that into an essay, you would then talk about how the lines, the curved lines create this emotion of fear and how the odd colors create this emotion and how the alienness of the figure and the, the obscurity of the figures in the background, nothing seems real, creates this atmosphere of fear and so on and so forth. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, now our final section. What is the difference between painting and illustration? I mean, what is an artist? Is a painter the same as an illustrator? Do they both deserve the title of artist? And why or why not? Um, so how about Norman Rockwell? He was most famous for uh, the Saturday Evening Post covers, but... He's got here the problem we all live with, which is about the integration of schools in uh, Arkansas, Little Rock. Yeah, I think Little Rock. And this brave young girl getting marched across this, you know, background of brutality and hatred, carrying her school books. Does that create emotion? Does that create an argument? Does that evoke feeling in the same way that a painting would? What about this, where he's, you know, illustrating himself, looking at himself? It's definitely kind of a comment on the self-reflexivity of art. So, and he's got various artists, self-portraits here. So he's casting himself in their, in their same lineage. Or here, the sea captain with the young boy, which has got, you know, the images of paternal love and affection the boy and the dog looking up attentively, the old man explaining his ship. It's, you know, it, it's an image of family. Do these evoke feelings? Do these evoke messages? If so, how are they different than, say, Van Gogh or Rembrandt or anything like that? Okay, 
might be easy to say that Norman Rockwell is an artist. What about Jack Kirby? Famous for the Kirby stance, as seen here, this, you know, jumping pose with a fist out or both fists out and the chin forward. Kirby chin is always famous. Uh, the Kirby crackle, which you see here. And you ever wonder why Thor had all that futuristic shit in it? That's because of Jack Kirby. He, for some reason, decided it was going to be super futuristic sci-fi 70s uh, and all his dongles and doohickeys. All of that got copied into Thor. Is Jack Kirby an artist? I mean, he certainly has a distinct style. Does it convey a message? Or does it convey the feeling of power, of alienness? of strength and bravery and determination. I don't know. I mean, I, I did my dissertation on comics, so I'm kind of a biased audience, but you know, your mileage may vary. How about Boris Vallejo? Uh, famous for the covers of Conan, uh, um, basically any half naked woman with swords, uh, usually with a half naked guy with swords with some sort of alien hanging around. That's Boris Vallejo. Uh, you might call it panel van art. You know, the kind of thing you would see spray painted on the side of a van that is both really cool and really tacky. Um, you know, if we accept Jack Kirby as an artist, why not Boris Vallejo? It contains images of strength. Uh, a lot of, you know, you might say, well, it's too pornographic for art, but uh, a lot of paintings were about half naked women because, well, artists were men and liked half naked women um also the beauty of the human form and all that but mostly half naked women i think uh i, I think they came up with a, a fancy justification for wanting to paint that in the first place so you know where do we draw the line and i'm not necessarily trying to argue that boris vallejo is art i like his stuff i think in kind of that you know it's it's like popcorn for the eyes. I don't think it's necessarily deep or impactful or meaningful, but I still find it fun. Um, I have definitely role-played these characters in games and they're a lot of fun to play, especially if they're really, really dumb. Um, but I'm, I'm, I think it's an important question to ask, where do we draw the line and why? And if we, it might be just that thing that you know it when you see it, but again, we have to investigate that. H.R. Geiger, the guy who uh, invented, who drew the alien, the xenomorph, and also did a bunch of weird, always kind of sexualized, just bizarro stuff. Like, I, this is the tamest stuff I, some of the tamest stuff I could find. Um, I'll let you go down that rabbit hole on your own. But he was an illustrator, and he had a very distinct style, and it definitely creates a feeling of horror and alienation and fear in this case like oh god um again where is the line <clears throat> and to end on a lighter note alex ross uh famous he is a painter so he paints his comic book covers and comic book posters and comic various comic books that he has done um kingdom come marvels uh those are the big ones but he's really really good and again does this you know represent strength power truth justice in the american way you know i i would argue that this is art but again biased audience so what do you think um hopefully you found this powerpoint if not necessarily well hopefully you found it somewhat interesting um, I think that art enriches all our lives, and that's kind of the premise of the class, so ha 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 ha, you have to get along anyway. But yeah, I hope you found it interesting, watch the videos, and thank you for coming. Bye.